To preface this story, I should clarify this was not a serious game. The idea was spun as a shit post to my GM while I was sleep deprived, and it took roughly 2 months to actually bring it up to the rest of the group. Secondly, I must set the stage with the background lore of the Space Marine chapter that would end up getting more involved with the Rogue Trader dynasty than is probably legal. Enter the Guardian Champions, Sons of Gilliman and Protectors of Akotha 3. Akotha 3 can best be summarized as ancient Rome, but in South America, Akotha 3 has no advanced industries, because that would require a technology level well beyond building aqueducts and discovering lead pipes. Utterly insignificant planet even by the grimdark standards of the 41st millennium so insignificant that if it wasn't for a prognostication predicting a tyrannid invasion in the next couple of centuries, it'd probably have been completely ignored. Such a threat surely warrants the creation of a chapter of a start to handle it, and what better progenitors are there for such a chapter but the Emperor's finest, the Ultramarines unfortunately for these braver starts. Akotha 3 is in the galactic north, and is not due for a tyrannid invasion worth writing about until GW introduces a fourth major hive fleet. Doubly unfortunately for these brave astarts is the fact that the records of their chapter were lost in the literal sense. Not destroyed, not stolen, but actually just misplaced and no one can find it with no record of their existence. The Guardian Champions no longer receive supplies from the Imperium. This could be managed by a more conservative approach, except Akotha 3 was hit by an invasion 5 decades after the chapter's founding an invasion of Death Skulls, downward spinal astropath. After fighting through a tide of blue and green mental retardation, the Guardian Champions found that most of their weaponry and ammunition had been used or stolen. The Guardian Champions are now officially up a creek without a paddle, because the Greenskins took the damned paddles too. But hope is not yet lost. You see, like any good son of Gilliman should, the Guardian Champions keep an autistic volume of documents tracking the lineage of every initiate that enters their ranks. One such initiate, Alicimia Serraris, just so happened to be the descendant of an Afwarilda, the philandering subspecies of humanity referred to as a rogue trader by Imperial citizens that know how to read things that aren't instruction manuals. Of course, this is utterly meaningless for an aspiring space marine, especially when said rogue trader didn't stick around for more than he absolutely had to, as that would hurt profit margins. This was all largely irrelevant to the Guardian Champions, who have been maintaining a skeleton crew as they slowly try to undo the loss in manpower they experienced from the Orc invasion, until it wasn't. One day, while training with his fellow scout marines to be another example of the Emperor's finest and getting yelled at by the scout sergeant for not even being mediocre, Lysimius received summons from the chapter master, a jaded, melancholic starts called Ignatius. It turns out writs of trade have very convoluted lines of succession built into them it turns out Lysimius happens to be the next in line to receive said writ of trade it turns out that being connected to a rogue trader dynasty is a great way for a chapter to be supplied. Lysimius does not take this news very well, because it means he will have to divert his attention away from training to be a proper space marine. Unfortunately for him, Ignatius doesn't care. And Soitbudgeon's cogitator. Chapter Master Ignatius is not unreasonable, however, and will be attaching several specialists to guide, see, handle, Lysimius and make sure he still receives training that a space marine would need. Enter Tetchmarine Isinder, wearing the robe of a librarian, who was evidently busy entering one of the locals in the back of a rhino. Based off the background noise from the Vox as he was summoned by Ignatius. Bitches love rhinos. Enter Pertinax the librarian, complaining about the lack of dehumidifiers the in librarius and the fact that someone stole his robe. Enter a wave of manic depression, followed shortly thereafter by Chaplain Soloditus and lastly, enter Grava from stage left, with a 5 minute monologue about how exciting it will be to install the black carapace in a medical facility that isn't part of the fortress monastery, with no fanfare. Lysimius and his less than qualified retinue depart onto a shuttle that had been waiting for the past 3 hours as Ignatius weighed his options before deciding it was worth a shot. You see, 
Lysimius wasn't actually the heir to the writ of trade. He was actually the newest holder of the writ of trade. It was explained to him on the way to Port Wander aboard a cargo hauler that the last holder of the writ of trade died fighting chaos pirates because he made the common mistake of not wearing a helmet. It turns out that vacuum exposure doesn't care about your valor. This left his dynasty without a head, and his head without oxygen, heat, or air pressure, all of which are very important to existing. Lysimius would be escorted to Port Wanda, where introductions would be given and profit would be pursued. The day of the meeting, the rogue trader's retinue was enjoying a shore leave ways varying from reasonable to being a public menace. And meal. A trainee Vindicare assassin rented out from the temple with money and other nebulous favors, was praying at a shrine of the emperor for his former captain. Explorator Lathe was engaging in conversation with his peers aboard their vessel, the Obsidian Mare, which boiled down to a screaming match between two of the Margos arguing about appliances and a thinly veiled lover's quarrel. Lathe decided to leave the two to their quarrel as he saw crewman handling a power coupling suboptimally and decided he needed to lecture his head off. Master of Ordnance Rook was at a proper bar, shooting the shit with Imperial Guard veterans a fraction of his age, including a Cadian that was lamenting that his severe facial burns meant he could only grow half of the impressive facial hair his daring commander sported. The orc got dragged to a dive bar by some of the rowdier crew that worked with him keeping the bilge mutants in check. This led to a series of misfortunate events resulting several hundred arrests after the orc taught some ogrins the orc game of smack smack crump. When it came time to greet their new captain, the retinue all arrived at the fine restaurant, including the NPCs that filled in the roles the players didn't. This meet and greet was doing well. Especially as the orc was in manacles on pain of death if he removed them, sanctioned Xenos or not. As is tradition in any RPG, this meeting of PCS quickly went south, as a lockdown was called for the entirety of Port Wanda. Numerous felons had broken loose and were either trying to escape, trying to hide, or trying to commit more crimes. Of course these felons had bounties which meant profit for their arrests not heeding sensible notions like staying put and letting the Arbites handle it, Lysimius decided that this was an excellent time to get to know the men and greenskin he would have the misfortune of placing his life in the hands of. It took approximately 13 minutes for things to go wrong. It turns out, even after the pains Lysimius went through to find a tie that covered his still painful black carapace implants. His appearance was still going to be a problem this was because he looked just like one of the felons. A calico jack but he wasn't the only one to resemble this handsome rogue. In fact, one of the members of a rapidly approaching lynch mob also shared this uncanny resemblance. It also just so happened that this devilishly handsome doppelganger seemed rather adamant about setting the mob on Lysimius and his retinue of men more qualified for homicide than running a ship. Lathe excluded. The space marines, not concerned with the imperial rat race, went to guard either the obsidian mare or assist the arbites with restoring order at their HQ, so this fight was closer to fed and would be preferred. Fortunately, Bolt Shells and Daka don't care about feelings of zeal, and the very real Calico Jack quickly decided to run for an alleyway rather than stick around to discover this first hand. And meal. Being trained in the art of not letting a target run away, gave chase and decided that the fastest way to stop a man from running was to take away his ability to do so in a shot that would make an elder concede something resembling approval. And Mill pulled out his Exodus pistol and took a shot that removed a chunk of a building's corner, and Jack's leg that was already behind it. The screams of a man that just received a ballistic amputation as well as Lysimius asserting his identity and dynasty made the lynch mob lose their zeal, as did the unfortunate death of the priest leading them at the hands of the orc. After making a very awful excuse for a tourniquet, Jack was carried like luggage to the Arbite HQ, where reports of an attempted ship theft were flooding in. Not wanting to miss out on the chance for more profit and an excuse to roll dice and kill things dead, the party set out once more. So I hear you guys are into thick big titty wafers. Well we got you covered at nickbedgear.co.uk. One stop shop for Kumja models. 
However we do sell a lot more than just smart models we got everything for running any fantasy settings and even some not grim dark science fiction models. In fact we even have some anime inspired models and video game. But if models is not your thing we also have some role playing adventures and DND 5e meme subclasses. Also every video we will be giving away all our homebrew content to a subscriber of the channel. All you got to do to be in with a chance is subscribe. Today's winner is this guy. Well done. Claim your prize by contacting us via email at nickbeardiacontact at gmail.com. Now let's get back to the video. Having borrowed a maintenance cart only barely faster than Lysimius, our stalwart murder merchant set out once more to stop crime because of financial incentives. Unfortunately, they arrived far too late to do anything meaningful. The criminal, whose name I did not write down in my notes, had managed to convince the crew to mutiny against the owner of some cargo hauler. By the time the party arrived, the ship was departing, even while several umbilicals were still attached. Dice were rolled. Somehow nothing explodes. With nothing worthwhile to do at this point, and with the few mutineers that got left behind not being worth a single profit factor, the retinue opts to leave the scene for the Arbites to sort out. On their way back, the station is rocked by an explosion that was easily within driving distance of the party. Of course, going off the tried and true logic of violence leading to profit, the party immediately changes course and heads to the area of the explosion. The party arrives at the scene of a terror bombing within half an hour. It turns out that one of the felons that got loose was a psychic mutant terrorist. Said PMT was targeting noble housing across Port Wanda using ides that he was making as he ran somehow. After consulting a cogitator that only nearly blew up when Lathe pulled residential information from it, the party figured there were only three targets within the immediate area that the PMT could target. They found out one of those houses was a navigator estate, and learned from said navigators that there was no way the PMT could sneak onto the estate without being seen on account of everyone and their mother having submissions there. Second time's the charm. The retinue went to the next potential target, and arrived just in time to watch it collapse in a fireball. But it seemed that the PMT liked to watch his handiwork, as he stepped out of the rubble to meet the approaching cart stepped out was a misnomer. In truth, the PMT stepped through it. It seems that on top of being hideous enough to warrant a fear rating, and having low level psychic powers, he could phase through objects with whatever he was carrying Lysimius, knowing nothing about mutants beyond that bit in the codex saying to purge them, figured there had to be a limit to his phasing, as he wasn't falling through the floor and promptly ordered Rook, who was driving the cart, to ram into the mutant rook complied, and then promptly remembered he did not have operate, surface, as a trained skill, you what dot vox signal. The retinue proceeded to crash through the PMT, who is not phased by the vehicle passing through him, and into still burning rubble. Downward spiral 2, electric boogaloo. The orc is on fire and can't attack the mutant with a sanctified torch we had taken from the priest we previously killed in self defense. Lysimius is too tough to care about the fire, but fatigue doesn't care about little things like health. Rook is stunned at the wheel, fortunately not burning. Anmiel is simply too agile to care about being made of flammable materials lathe as to disrobe as oil stains are evidently not OSHA compliant. PMT starts levitating and gloating. Lysimius jumps out of the car to attempt to pull it out of the fire the orc is burning. Rook is still stunned. And Meal, fight or fight instincts having kicked in, grabs the torch off of the orc and assumes a running stance. Lathe starts sweating profusely from the heat. Lysimius realizes what Anmiel is going to try and do and takes a knee. Confusing the PMT Anmiel proceeds to do a running leap off of Lysimius' broad shoulders, torch in hand, and strikes the PMT across the face. It seems that sanctioned weapons do wonders against unholy mutants and their warp based nonsense. PMT decides to leg it, as he is no longer as impervious as he though. Lysimius goes full of starts mode under the stress of both a fear rating and his first real combat scenario, pulls the still burning to death orc, rook, and lathe out of the burning cart and tosses them onto not burning ground. 
Books it after the PMT, only slowing down to put out his still burning cape. A 700 throne jacket was ruined this day, and Meal follows close behind. Despite the mutant's ability to phase through walls, Lysimius somehow manages to catch up to the mutant through blind luck. Mutant turns to face Lysimius, starts levitating off the ground like a damn cheater so as not to get bludgeoned by the torch again. Starts monologuing about destroying the Imperium or some such nonsense while fiddling with what is blatantly another IED. Lysimius hears none of it because of the ringing in his ears and the sound of both of his heart slamming in his chest. And Meal, being a professional assassin, stays out of sight and readies his Exotus rifle scope on the PMT's head. And Meal figures that if the mutant's gear phases with him, then the mutant has to be tangible to actually use his bombs. Blah 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 I'll start by killing you, rogue trader. Lysimius, an amateur in the art of heroic retorts, simply shouts back yeah well, I'll frack you. The mutant gets a really toothy grin, exposing his needle sharp teeth, and drops the IED he had been working on down to Lysimius, the device beeping as it fell. Lysimius responds with a grin of his own, saying I win a moment before Anmiel dematerializes the mutant's head with a bullet that is considered overkill for TAU hammerheads. Unfortunately for Lysimius, the mutant certainly knew how to make bombs, and he could not leap out of the blast radius of a charge meant to level a building. When the tinnitus subsided, Lysimius had just enough time to call for Anmiel before immediately devolving pain howling as the absence of both of his legs became apparent unfortunately for Anmiel. Being a professional assassin means you are very good at not getting hurt. This is unfortunate because this means you're probably going to be the only guy capable of carrying your captain when he gets his legs blown of acting as bait. Several hours of dragging later. And the retinue makes it to the HQ without any further injuries, because no one wants to mug an orc, having successfully bagged a whole two felons. The party earned a whopping two profit factor from the Arbites. But there was still one convict that no one had detained, and she was far more wily than the rest. Unfortunately for her, the Arbites have records, including known connections. She happened to have had business dealings with a noble on this station. The rest of the party far too exhausted and maimed to pursue her. So Anmiel goes it alone Arbites are still quelling riots. So there is no support. Anmiel gets as far knocking on the door of the noble's manor before he sees something quickly slink into the wine cellar of the estate. Several poorly concealed lies later. And Anmiel knows the noble knows he knows that the felon is hiding on the estate. But can't exactly do anything to stop an emperor damn vindicare. Anmiel enters the wine cellar after the talking concludes, and takes several steps inside before a power rapier is thrust towards his face from his right. He retaliates by attempting to shoot his assailant at point blank with his Exitus pistol, only processing her identity as the bounty as she ducks out of the way. What proceeds in the next 18 seconds is the most ridiculous display of CQC possible think that ridiculous gunfight in Resident Evil Vendetta and you have a good idea both sides proceed to dodge lethal attacks they have no business avoiding, doing more damage to fine wine than to each other. After the third shot, Anmiel realizes how many thrones he has just spent in ammo on a woman he hasn't killed. Anmiel starts sweating profusely as he contemplates how expensive this fight has been attempts to talk the felon down for the sake of not turning this fight into a financial net loss it actually works. Turns out she is only a felon because she killed several members of a rogue trader dynasty after they killed her child and turned him into a cherub because he was next in line to inherit a writ of trade. There's the grimdark future we were waiting for. It turns out she is more than qualified to manage planets or other profit printing establishments a rogue trader might run. And Meal uses the vox bead we all made sure to bite to contact Lysimius on a private channel. Asks what Lysimius what he wants to do. And Lysimius, painfully coherent as human grade painkillers aren't close to good enough for a space marine. Give Anmiel full license to decide for himself what to do. Anmiel. Not certain that killing the felon would be in his captain's interests. Arts to spare her if she works for Lysimius dynasty. She agrees as long as she doesn't have to work directly with the Imperium. 
and several black market purchases later she is disguised well enough to slip through 40k customs and is given a guest quarter on the obsidian mare, concluding the endeavor. Lysimius and company acquired two profit factor in exchange for two legs, their dignity, and five exitus rounds. All in all a successful endeavor, if you ignore the net profit loss, might post the misadventure with the worm at a later date, but this has already taken over an hour and I don't have it in me to keep going, might have missed some details, but when my GM reads this he can talk my head off about them.